Is Thomas Edison the greatest inventor in history? Some believe that he is, and for good reason, Thomas Alva Edison, 1847-1931. The so-called Wizard of Menlo Park, registered 1,300 patents in his name during his lifetime. More than have been credited to any other individual in American history. His best-known inventions include an automatic telegraphy machine, a stock ticker machine, the phonograph. 1,877, the incandescent light bulb, 1878, and the motion picture machine, kinetoscope, 1891. Edison also made one major scientific find during his research, when he observed that electrons are emitted from a heated cathode. The conductor in an electron tube, the phenomenon is known as the Edison effect. When Edison was still in his twenties, he set up a laboratory where 50 consulting engineers worked with him on various inventions. By his own description, the Newark, New Jersey, plant was an invention factory. It operated for six years, during which Edison was granted about 200 new patents for work completed there. The laboratory is regarded by most as the first formally organized non-academic research center in the United States. By 1876 Edison had outgrown his Newark facilities and arranged for the construction of a new plant at Menlo Park, New Jersey. His most productive work was accomplished at this location over the next decade. Who was Confucius and who do people still quote him? Confucius 551 to 479 B. C. was a Chinese philosopher whose real name was Kaung Chiu. Confucius is the Latinized version. Born into a class of lesser nobility in the province of Lu. His father died before Confucius had turned three and he was raised in humble circumstances by his mother. He lived in the middle of China's feudal period, when there were enormous problems. Including famine and poverty, which had been brought on by weak emperors and Consequently, chronic warfare among rival feudal states. Because of his upbringing, Confucius possessed a profound sympathy for the common people. In his view, the feudal princes, only interested in their own personal gain, were responsible for the suffering of the people. Confucius set out on a reform mission, believing that good government can only be achieved by ethical leaders. Confucius endeavored to train a new generation of them. He taught literature and music, important in building character, conduct, and, most importantly, ethics, to anyone who wanted to learn. He is regarded as the first Chinese teacher to offer education freely. That is to say, to all comers, rather than just the privileged. The great philosopher is revered for his belief that the family is the model for all human relations. Confucianism regards the chief relations in life to be those between ruler and subject. Father and son, 
elder and younger brother, husband, and wife, and friends. Most importantly, he taught students that rulers are responsible for the happiness of their subjects. He believed that government leaders need not be expert administrators. Instead, they must be humane, honest, and above corruption and personal gain. Some of his students went on to hold positions of power in city governments. Over the centuries, he became the most venerated person in Chinese history. But his teachings transcend cultural lines, which is why Confucian wisdom, including the principle what you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others, is often quoted. The philosophy's maxims are set forth in the work Lun Yu, Analects, recorded by his followers. Except for his time spent in military service, Socrates lived his entire life in Athens, where he was as well known for his disheveled appearance as for his moral integrity, self-control, and quest for wisdom. He lived during a time when attention was turning away from the physical world of the heavens, and toward the human world, of the self, the community, and the law. He participated in this turning point by walking the streets of Athens, engaging people including rulers who were supposed to be wiser than he in conversation. In these conversations, he employed what came to be known as the Socratic method or dialectic. A series of seemingly simple questions designed to elicit a rational response. Through the line of questioning, which usually centered around a moral concept such as courage. The person being questioned was intended to realize that he did not truly know that which he thought he knew. Socrates's theory was that once the person being questioned realized his weak understanding, he could divest himself of false notions, and was then free to participate in the quest for knowledge. These philosophical disputes, however, gained Socrates many enemies. Though he left no writings, Socrates a student, Plato, documented his recollections of dialogues with his teacher. A staunch believer in self-examination and self-knowledge. Socrates is credited with saying that the unexamined life is not worth living, some ascribe the quote to Plato. Socrates also believed that the psyche, or inner self, is what should give direction to one's life not appetite or passions. A seminal figure in Greek, and Western, thought, philosophy that predates him is termed pre-Socratic. Why was Socrates condemned to death? Socrates, c. 470 to 399 BC, the Greek philosopher who is credited, along with philosophers Plato, c. 428 to 347 BC. And Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, for laying the foundations of Western thought, had many followers in his own time. However, his ideas and methods were controversial, too. Which led him to be tried before judges and sentenced to death, which he carried out by drinking hemlock, poison. He had been charged for not worshipping the Athenian gods and for corrupting the young.
When did mobile phones first come into use? Mobile communication dates back to radio phones used in the 1940s and 1950s. They were two-way radio systems that were powered by car batteries and required operator assistance. They were not very reliable, and the phones were anchored to a place, not a person. The first truly mobile phone call, in that it used a portable handset, was manufactured on April 3, 1973. The caller was Dr. Martin Cooper of Motorola, who, from the streets of Manhattan, called rival researcher Joel Engel at Bell Laboratories. At NT's research arm, the two companies were in a heated race to develop mobile telephony. The device used by Cooper that day was called the Dynatac. It weighed two pounds and had simple dial, talk, and listen features. The first generation of mobile phones began to be widely used in the 1980s. These phones were large by today's standards and were usually installed in a car or briefcase. Transmission was via clusters of base stations, or cellular networks. The next generation of mobile phones appeared in the 1990s. The handset and battery technology improved, allowing for more features in smaller sized phones and greater mobility. These were reliable phones that people could carry with them. As more users adopted the technology, cellular providers expanded transmitting systems. In some areas of the world, Usage took off to the point of near universality by 2000. Usage in the United States. Though strong, lagged behind the rest of the developed world. Some analysts believed that this was due to relatively high service fees. While others cited a lack of reliability, especially in rural areas. The land-based telephone system in the United States was designed to nine nines of reliability. Meaning it can be counted on to function 99.9999999% of the time. A standard as yet unmet by cellular technology. When was the structure of DNA discovered? In 1953 American biologist James Dewey Watson, 1928, and British biophysicist Francis Crick. 1916-2004, developed a model of the structure of DNA. Short for deoxyribonucleic acid, the acid found in cell nuclei. The scientists posited that DNA is constructed of a double helix. A spiral ladder, held together by hydrogen bonds. In reaching this conclusion, the pair relied on data gathered by British biophysicist Maurice Wilkins, 1916-2004. In the Watson-Crick model, each rung of the DNA ladder consists of two pairs of chemicals. When DNA is replicated, which it is during reproduction, the ladder rungs are divided and the legs form new ladders, identical to the original. The model has helped scientists understand how genetic traits are passed from parent to offspring. Cells in the human body have 46 chromosomes, arranged in 23 pairs, children inherit half a set of chromosomes. 
thread-like bodies in the nucleus of a cell, from each parent, and different combinations of the parent's DNA. A process called recombination, produces offspring of different, though related, inherited characteristics. Each person's genetic information is carried in his or her DNA between 10 and 20 billion miles of it. Which is distributed among trillions of cells in the average human body. The study of DNA's structure has proved invaluable to scientists working in the fields of evolution. Pathology, forensics, and many others. DNA's fingerprinting ability is so powerful that forensic scientists can use the DNA found on a single strand of human hair to identify the owner. In 1962 Watson, Crick, and Wilkins shared the Nobel Prize for their groundbreaking work on DNA. How old is standard time? Standard time was introduced in 1884, it was the outcome of an international conference held in Washington, D. C. to consider a worldwide system of time. By international agreement, Earth was divided into 24 different standard time zones. Within each time zone, all clocks are to be set to the same time. The device of standardized time zones was necessitated by the expansion of industry, businesses. Particularly those in the transportation industry, could not coordinate schedules when each community used its own solar time. The local time as determined by the position of the sun. Railroad schedules had been extremely complicated before the establishment of standard time zones, which the railroads readily adopted. Each time zone spans 15 degrees of longitude, beginning at zero longitude, called the prime meridian, which passes through the observatory at Greenwich, a borough of London, England. Time kept at the observatory is called Greenwich Mean Time, GMT. Time zones are described by their distance east or west of Greenwich. The model also dictates that each time zone is one hour apart from the next. However, the borders of the time zones have been adjusted throughout the world to accommodate national, state, and provincial boundaries. The contiguous United States has four time zones, Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific. Waters off the eastern seaboard are in the Atlantic time zone, Alaska, Hawaii, Samoa, Wake Island, and Guam each have their own time zones. Congress gave the Interstate Commerce Commission, ICC, authority to establish limits for U.S. time zones in 1918. This authority was transferred to the Department of Transportation, DOT, in 1967. How long have sundials been in use? Sundials which indicate the time of day by the shadow cast by a stick, pin, or other object. Usually on a horizontal plate, have been in use since before the 6th century B. C. When both the ancient Chinese and Egyptians used the device to tell time. 
sundials proved to be a fairly accurate indicator of the passage of time. But it has its problems, a sundial can be difficult to read. The markings have to be adjusted according to latitude, and the readings differ with the seasons. They remain popular as garden ornaments today. Is it true that Edison had no formal education? It's almost true, Thomas Edison, 1847-1931, had no formal education to speak of. Born in Milan, Ohio, Edison's father moved the family to Port Huron, Michigan. In 1854, their young Edison attended school for the first time in a one-room schoolhouse where he was taught by the Reverend and Mrs. G. B. Engel. But this arrangement lasted just a few months. The boy grew impatient with his schooling behavior his teachers interpreted as a sign of mental inferiority. When Edison overheard Mrs. Engel refer to him as adult, he reported it to his mother, Nancy, who promptly withdrew him from the school. From then on his mother taught him at home. Introducing young Edison to natural philosophy a mixture of physics, chemistry, and other sciences. He showed an inclination toward science. And by the age of 10 he was conducting original experiments in the family's home. Edison furthered his education through voracious reading. He sought, and was granted, permission to sell periodicals, snacks, and tobacco to passengers on the train between Port Huron and Detroit, Michigan, some 60 miles away. During the layover in downtown Detroit, Edison spent his time at the public library, where, according to his own recollection, he read not a few books, but the entire library. Even though he lacked a formal education, Edison possessed a keen mind and a natural curiosity. Further, he had the benefit of the schooling provided by his mother as well as access to a library, of which he took full advantage. Then something happened that changed Edison's life, while still a young man, he lost his hearing. Biographer Matthew Josephson explains that the deafness had two effects on Edison, not only did he become more solitary and shy, but Edison turned with an even greater intensity toward his studies and began to put forth tremendous efforts at self-education, for he had absolutely to learn everything for himself. How old is the World Wide Web? The web, which adds an ease of use layer to the Internet by providing a graphical user interface. GUI, was developed in 1990 by English computer scientist Tim Berners-Lee. 1955 who wrote the web software at the CERN Physics Laboratory near Geneva, Switzerland. Berners-Lee wrote a program defining hypertext markup language, HTML. Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP, and Universal Resource Locators, URLs. The web became part of the Internet in 1991 and has played a major role in the growing popularity of the International Computer Network, 
making information more accessible to the user via multimedia interfaces, which allow the presentation of graphics, formatted text and hyperlinks, photos, and illustrations, as well as streaming or downloadable audio and video. How old is the oldest clock? He first mechanical timekeeping device was a water clock called a clepsidra, which was used from about 1500 B. C through the Middle Ages, 500-1350. One very elaborate clepsidra was constructed for Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne, 742 to 814, in a d800. Upon the hour, it dropped a metal ball into a bowl. Because of problems with water, it evaporated, froze, and eroded the surfaces of its container. A more accurate device was needed. It is believed that the first completely mechanical clock was developed by a monk around 1275. The clock was driven by the slow pull of a falling weight that had to be reset to its starting position after several hours. The clocks in monasteries were among the first to be fitted as alarm clocks. Striking mechanisms were added to the timekeeping devices so the monks would know when to ring the monastery bell. Other calendars remain in use in the world today, including the Lunar Babylonian, Chinese, and Muslim calendars, the Jewish calendar, which is a combination of solar and lunar and the solar Coptic, Japanese, and Hindu calendars. Secular calendars include the Julian day, used by astronomers, and the perpetual calendar, which gives the days of the week for the Julian and the Gregorian calendar, and therefore is used by historians and other scholars to reconcile world events along a single timeline. What was the philosophy of the Middle Ages? During medieval times, 500-1350, philosophers concerned themselves with applying the works of ancient Greek thinkers, such as Aristotle, 384-322b. C, and Plato, C 428 to 347 BC, to Christian thought. This movement, which spanned most of the Middle Ages and reached its high water mark in the 13th century, was called scholasticism since its proponents were often associated with universities. The word scholastic is derived from the Greek scholastikos, meaning to keep a school. In the simplest terms, the goal of scholasticism has been described as the Christianization of Aristotle. Indeed, medieval philosophers strived to use reason to better understand faith. Scholasticism was, therefore, both rational and religious. The movement was also an interesting occasion of East meets West. The commentaries of Islamic philosophers, principally Avon Nasr, c. 878-950, Averroes, 1126-1198, and Avicenna, 
1037, figured prominently in scholasticism. Theologians including St. Anselm and St. Thomas Aquinas, used the non-Christian philosophy both of the ancient Greeks and of Muslim thinkers to better understand their own Christian faith. Who invented the television? the television, which may seem to many to be a decidedly American invention, was actually the outcome of a series of inventions by a cast of international characters. As early as 1872 British engineer Willoughby Smith, 1828-1891. Inspired by an experiment on selenium rods, imagined a system of visual telegraphy. Five years later, the tube technology that would make television possible was developed in Strasbourg by German physicist Karl Ferdinand Braun, 1850-1918. He invented a cathode ray tube, also known as the Braun tube which improved the Marconi wireless, radio, technology by increasing the energy of sending stations and arranged antennas to control the direction of radiation. In 1907 Russian physicist Boris Rosing proposed using bronze tube to receive images something he called electric vision. One year later, Alan Campbell Swinton, 1863-1930 Suggested using the cathode ray tube to both receive and transmit images. That same year, the idea of using cathode ray tubes to scan images for The purpose of television was published, and by 1912 it was being worked on by Rosing and his former pupil. Vladimir Zwerikin, 1889-1982, in Russia. In 1923 a competing technology, which was entirely mechanical, reached an early milestone when British inventor John Logie Baird, 1888-1946, demonstrated an electrified hatbox with discs which constituted the world's first working television set. But the race was still on and in that same year, Zwerikin, who had moved to the United States in 1919 and was hired by Westinghouse Electronic Corporation, in 1920, advanced the tube-based technology when he patented the iconoscope, which would become the television camera. In 1929 Zwerikin, now a U.S. citizen, invented the Kinescope, television tube. Zwerikin's inventions together comprised the first electronic television. Regularly scheduled U.S. television began on April 30, 1939, when President Franklin D. Roosevelt, 1882-1945, opened the New York World's Fair, billed as the World of Tomorrow. Giving a speech that was the first televised presidential talk. The National Broadcasting Company's, NBC, coverage of the fair's opening initiated its weekly television scheduling. A victory for parent company RCA, whose president. David Sarnoff, 1891-1971, founded NBC and is considered a broadcasting pioneer.
When was the computer chip developed? The computer chip, or integrated circuit, was developed in the late 1950s by two researchers who were working independently of each other, Jack Kilby, 1923, of Texas Instruments, who developed his chip in 1958, and by Robert Noyce, 1927-1990, of Fairchild Semiconductor, in 1959. The chip is an electronic device made of a very small piece. Usually less than one quarter inch square, of silicon wafer, and today has typically hundreds of thousands miniature transistors and other circuit components that are interconnected. Since its development in the late 1950s, the number of tiny components a chip can have has steadily risen. Improving computer performance, since the chips perform a computer's control, logic, and memory functions. A computer's microprocessor is a single chip that holds all of the computer's logic and arithmetic. It is responsible for interpreting and executing instructions given by a computer program, software. The microprocessor can be thought of as the brain of the computer's operating system. Many other consumer electronic devices rely on the computer chip as well. Including the microwave, the VCR, and calculators. What were Sir Francis Bacon's beliefs? The English philosopher, author, and statesman was one of the great minds of the scientific revolution of the 1500s and 1600s, during which the way that Europeans viewed themselves and the universe underwent a dramatic change. Bacon, 1561-1626, believed that humankind's accepted Notions about nature should be aggressively challenged. As a young man studying at Trinity College, he concluded that the Aristotelian system or deductive logic was without merit, Bacon favored observation or inductive logic as a system for interpreting and understanding nature. He argued that the understanding of nature was being held back by the blind acceptance of the beliefs of ancient philosophers such as Aristotle, 384-322 BC, and Plato, c. 428-347 BC. A religious person, Bacon maintained that theology should not be questioned. He believed that rational inquiry can unlock the secrets of nature but not of the human soul. Bacon therefore insisted on the separation of philosophy and theology. An idea that ran counter to the academic traditions of the time. Consequently he was a staunch proponent of educational and scientific reform. Trained in law. Bacon served as a royal diplomat in France, was admitted to the bar, elected to Parliament, and served in public office, including the jobs of Solicitor General and Attorney General. He penned several seminal works, including Essays, 1597, which consists of practical wisdom and observations. Advancement of Learning, 1605, A Survey of the State of Knowledge 
Bacon was attempting to enlist the support of the king in the total reform of education and science in England, and Novum Organum, 1620. In which he put forth his method for understanding nature by an inductive system, based on direct observation. Versus Aristotle's deductive method, which was based on circumstantial evidence and prior conclusions. When was instant messaging introduced? The ability to send instant text messages over computers was introduced to the public in 1996. Internet service provider America Online, AOL, launched instant messaging or IM, as another way for its members to communicate with each other. By logging onto a home or work computer, or cell phone with internet capabilities. Users could view their buddy list and see which of their AOL contacts were online at the time. IM users could then send messages back and forth in real time, next door, or across thousands of miles. In 1997 AOL expanded the service to non-AOL users with a utility called AOL Instant Messaging. AIM, and in 1998 the company acquired another IM utility, ICQ. By 1999 MSN and Yahoo rolled out their instant messenger services, and others followed. The concept caught on, particularly with young users who embraced the concept of a private chat room. In 2004 a Pew Internet and American Life Project report estimated that 53 million Americans or 4 out of 10 Internet users, were instant messaging. IM had become the primary form of communication for many, replacing telephone calls and emails. The mode of communication also brought about a new shorthand or subculture language, with a heavy reliance on abbreviations and icons. The use of the technology continued to grow rapidly, expanding to practical business use. In 2004 analysts estimated that there were about 600 million registered IM users worldwide. When was the first fax machine developed? The fax, facsimile, machine may seem like a recent invention. But it was developed long ago it took more than 100 years for the machines to become part of everyday life. In 1842-1843 Scottish philosopher and psychologist Alexander Bain. 1818-1903, invented the first, albeit crude, fax machine. The scanning technology was improved enough by 1924 that. Newspapers began using the device to transmit photographs. By the 1930s wire photos were an important component of newspaper reports. It was not until the 1980s that faxes came into widespread use. As manufacturers produce the more compact and affordable machines that are visible in most every place of business today. What was Plato's relationship to Socrates and Aristotle?
The Athens-born Plato, originally, Aristocles, was Socrates' disciple and Aristotle's teacher. The philosophies of these three men combined to lay the foundations of Western thought. With the death sentence of his spiritual guide, Socrates, in 399 BC, Plato's. C 428 to 347 BC, dissatisfaction with the Athenian government reached its peak. Traveling throughout the Mediterranean after the death of Socrates. Plato returned to Athens in 387 BC, and one mile outside of the city he established the academy. A school of philosophy supported entirely by philanthropists, students paid no fees. One of the pupils there was young Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, who remained at the academy for 20 years before venturing out on his own. Plato wrote a series of dialogues in which Socrates figures prominently. The most highly regarded of these is the Republic, in which Plato discusses justice and the ideal state. It was his belief that people would not be able to eliminate injustice from society until rulers became philosophers. Until all philosophers are kings. Or the kings and princes of this world have the spirit and power of philosophy, and political greatness and wisdom meet in one. And those commoner natures who pursue either to the exclusion of the other are compelled to stand aside. Cities will never have rest from their evils no, nor the human race. Also on the subject of the ideal state, Plato wrote but did not finish laws. His other works include Symposium, which considers ideal love, Phaedrus which attacks the prevailing notions about rhetoric, apology, which is a rendering of the speech Socrates delivered at his own trial in 399 BC. And Phaedo, which discusses the immortality of the soul and which is supposed to be a record of Socrates's last conversation before he drank hemlock and died. When was color television invented? In 1940 Hungarian-American engineer Peter Karl Goldmark, 1906-1977 The head of the Columbia Broadcasting Systems, CBS, Research and Development Laboratory came up with a technology that broke down the television image into three primary colors through a set of spinning filters in front of black and white, causing the video to be viewed in color. His system gave way in the 1950s to an RCA system whose signals were compatible with conventional black and white TV signals. In September 1962 American Broadcasting Corporation, ABC, began color telecasts, for three and a half hours a week. By this time, competitor National Broadcasting Corporation, NBC, was broadcasting 68% of its prime time programming in color. While CBS had opted to confine itself to black and white after having transmitted in color earlier. By 1967 all three networks were broadcasting entirely in color. It was not until 1967 that color television was broadcast in England. 
On July 1 the BBC2 transmitted seven hours of programming, most of it coverage of lawn tennis from Wimbledon. Who were the great Islamic philosophers of the Middle Ages? Three thinkers of the Islamic world stand out as important interpreters of Greek thought. And therefore, as a bridge between ancient philosophy and the scholasticism of the Middle Ages. Their Latin names are Ava Nassar, Averroes, and Avicenna. Ava Nassar, c. 878-950, who studied with Christian Aristotelians in Baghdad, Iraq, proved so adept at applying the teachings of Aristotle, 384-322 BC. To Muslim thought that he became known as the second Aristotle or the second teacher. He posited that philosophy and religion are not in conflict with each other. Rather, they parallel one another. Also known for his work in interpreting the great Aristotle for the Muslim world. Avicenna, 980-1037 is sometimes referred to as the third teacher. He was also the first to expand the distinction between essence and existence. Averroes, 1126-1198, also was no stranger to Aristotle, writing commentaries on him as well as Plato. Specifically, the Republic. He also wrote on religious law and philosophy as well as religion and logic. Who invented the computer? English mathematician Charles Babbage 1792-1871, is recognized as the first to conceptualize the computer. He worked to develop a mechanical computing machine called the analytical engine, which is considered the prototype of the digital computer. While attending Cambridge University in 1812, Babbage conceived of the idea of a machine that could calculate data faster than could humans and without human error. These were the early years of the Industrial Revolution. And the world Babbage lived in was growing increasingly complex. Human errors in mathematical tables posed serious problems for many burgeoning industries. After graduating from Cambridge, Babbage returned to the idea of a computational aid. He spent the rest of his life and much of his fortune trying to build such a machine. But he was not to finish. Nevertheless, Babbage's never completed analytical engine, on which he began work in 1834, was the forerunner of the modern digital computer. A programmable electronic device that stores, retrieves, and processes data. Babbage's device used punch cards to store data and was intended to print answers. More than 100 years later, the first fully automatic calculator was invented. Development began in 1939 at Harvard University. Under the direction of mathematician Howard Aiken, 1900 to 1973, the first electronic digital computer, called Mark I, was invented in 1944. The Mark II followed in 1947. 
In 1946 scientists at the University of Pennsylvania completed NIAC. Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator, the first all-purpose electronic digital computer. Operating on 18,000 vacuum tubes, NIAC was large. Required great deal of power to run, and generated a lot of heat. The first computer to handle both numeric and alphabetical data with equal facility was the UNIVAC. Universal Automatic Computer, developed between 1946 and 1951, also at the University of Pennsylvania. What does Epicurean mean? While Epicurean has come to refer to anything relating to the pleasure of eating and drinking. It is an oversimplification of the beliefs of the Greek philosopher Epicurus, 341-270 b. C, from whose name the word was derived. While Epicurus did believe that pleasure is the only good, and that it alone should be humankind's pursuit. Later scholars misinterpreted the philosophy as a license for sensory excess. In actuality, Epicurus defined pleasure not as unbridled sensuality but as freedom from pain and as peace of mind. Which can only be obtained through simple living. In about 306 BC. Epicurus established a school in Athens which came to be known as the Garden School because residents provided for their own food by gardening. There he and his students strived to lead lives of simplicity, prudence, justice, and honor. In this way, they achieved tranquility the ultimate goal in life. According to the philosophy of Epicureanism, he further believed that intellectual pleasures are superior to sensual pleasures, which are fleeting. In fact he held that one of the greatest and most enduring pleasures is friendship. These ideas were put forth by the Greek philosopher and writer Lucretius. C99 C55 BC, in his poem On the Nature of Things. While the Epicurean school endured for several centuries. Ultimately, Christian leaders deemed the philosophy a pagan creed. However, some critics have posited that the writer of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament of the Bible was likely a member of the Garden School and that the epistles of St. Paul in the New Testament were strongly influenced by Epicurean thought. In more recent times, Thomas Jefferson, 1743-1826, author and signatory of the Declaration of Independence and third President of the United States, was a self-proclaimed Epicurean. Did Aristotle develop his own philosophy? A student of Plato's for 20 years, Aristotle's ideas were unquestionably influenced by his teacher. However, Aristotle developed his own doctrine, which he applied to many subjects. Aristotle rejected Plato's theory of forms, or theory of ideas. While Aristotle, too, believed in material, the physical being, and forms, the unchanging truths. Unlike his teacher, 
he believed that it is the concrete, material, that has substantial being. Aristotle viewed the basic task of philosophy as explaining why and how things are. Or how they become what they are. It is for this reason that Aristotle had not only a profound and lasting influence on philosophy but on scientific spirit. Why was the Internet invented? The computer network was invented in the late 1960s so that you S Department of Defense researchers could share information with each other and with other researchers. The Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, developed the internet, its users, who were mostly scientists and academics, saw the power of the new technology, wires linking computer terminals in a web of networks allow people anywhere in the world to communicate with each other over the computer. Even though it was developed by the government, the internet is not government run. The Internet Society, comprised of volunteers, addresses usage and standards issues. The technology caught on, made more accessible by the innovation of the user-friendly World Wide Web. In spring 2005 there were an estimated 888 million Internet users around the world. About 35% of them in Asia. 30% in Europe and 25% in North America, about 200 million of those in the United States. The powerful network had become part of everyday life in the developed world. When was email invented? Short for electronic mail, email was invented in 1971 by computer engineer Ray Tomlinson, 1941, who developed a communications program for computer users at the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA. The result was ARPANET, a program that allowed text messages to be sent to any other computer on the local network. ARPANET is now hailed as the Model T of the information superhighway. The technology expanded in the 1970s with the use of modems, which connect computers via telephone lines. Within a decade of its introduction, email had become widely used as a communications mode in the workplace. In the 1990s usage expanded rapidly to Internet users at home, schools, and elsewhere. Some technology analysts call email the killer app of the Internet. The most powerful tool on the worldwide computer network. Who were the great thinkers of scholasticism? Just as Islamic philosophers reinterpreted faith by applying reason. Subordinating revelation to reason, Western philosophers endeavored to incorporate the doctrines of Greek philosophy into the theology of the Christian Church. Leaders in this movement included St. Augustine, 
Augustine of Hippo, Saint Anselm, and Saint Thomas Aquinas. Augustine of Hippo, 354 to 430. Lived during a time when the last vestiges of the pagan world of the Romans was giving way to Christianity. His theological works, including sermons, books, and pastoral letters, reveal a Platonic influence, foreshadowing the movement of scholasticism that emerged more than six centuries later, during the 11th century. Augustine believed that understanding can lead one to faith and that faith can lead a person to understanding. He also argued that Christians can understand the nature of the Trinity by examining their own nature, through introspection. One of Scholasticism's founders, Anselm, c. 1033-1109, was a Benedictine monk who in 1093 became Archbishop of Canterbury. He became famous for writing about the attributes of God, in his work Monologian. And for trying to prove the existence of God, in Proslogion, by rational means alone. Arguing that God is that of which nothing greater can be thought, that of which nothing greater can be thought must include existence. If it did not, then something greater could be thought, and therefore God necessarily exists. But the greatest figure of scholasticism was St. Thomas Aquinas, 1225-1274, who is also one of the principal saints of the Roman Catholic Church. In 1879 his philosophical works were declared the official Catholic doctrine by Pope Leo XIII, 1810-1903. While he was teaching at universities in Cologne, Germany, and Paris between 1248 and 1272, Thomas Aquinas penned his major works. Summa Contra Gentiles, 1259-64, and Summa Theologica, 1266-73. He discarded the Platonic leanings of St. Augustine, to whom truth was a matter of faith interpreting Aristotle's naturalistic philosophy. Similar to the Islamic philosopher Ibn Nasr, c. 878-950, who argued that religion and philosophy are not in conflict with each other. Thomas Aquinas believed faith and reason are in harmony with each other. His work is considered the greatest achievement of medieval philosophy. Making the 13th century scholasticism's golden age. Thomas Aquinas was canonized in 1323 and was proclaimed a doctor of the Catholic Church in 1567. Who invented the steam engine? Like many other modern inventions, the steam engine had a long evolution. It was first conceived of by Greek scientist Hero of Alexandria in the 1st century AD. The Mathematician invented many contrivances that were operated by water, steam, or compressed air. These included not only a fountain and a fire engine, but the steam engine. Many centuries later, Englishman Thomas Newcomen 1663-1729, developed an early steam engine, about 1711, that was used to pump water. 
he was improving on a previous design, which had been patented by another inventor in 1698. But it was Scottish inventor James Watt. 1736-1819, who substantially improved Newcomen's machine. Patenting his own steam-powered engine in 1769. It was the first practical steam engine, and Watt's many improvements to the earlier. Technology paved the way for the use of the engine in manufacturing and transportation during the Industrial Revolution. C1750 C1850, Britain was just on the cusp of this new age when Watt patented his engine. The steam engine was eventually replaced by more efficient devices such as the turbine. Developed in the 1800s, the electric motor, also developed in the 1800s, the internal combustion engine. First practical engine built in 1860, and the diesel engine, patented 1892. Nevertheless, James Watt's steam engine played a critical role. In moving society from an agricultural to industrial-based economy. Watt's legacy also includes the use of horsepower and watts as units of measure. Who invented the thermometer? While the Greeks made simple thermometers as early as the 1st century B. C, it wasn't until Galileo, 1564-1642, that a real thermometer was invented. It was an air thermometer, in which a colored liquid was driven down by the expansion of air. So that as the air got warmer, and expanded, the liquid dropped. This is unlike ordinary thermometers in use today. Which rely on the colored liquid of mercury to rise as it gets warmer. In 1612 Italian physician Sant'Orio Sant'Orio, 1561-1636, a friend of Galileo. Adapted the device to measure the body's change in temperature due to illness. The clinical thermometer wasn't Santorio's only invention. As the first doctor to use precision instruments in the practice of medicine, Santorio also developed the pulse clock. It was a full century though before thermometers had a fixed scale. This was provided by German physicist Daniel Fahrenheit. 1686 to 1736, who in 1714 invented the mercury thermometer. Why is Aristotle considered one of the greatest minds in Western history? The system of philosophy that Aristotle, 384 to 322 b. c. developed became the foundation for European philosophy, theology, science, and literature. The Aristotelian system may be so much a part of the fabric of Western culture that the only effective way to describe his philosophy is through example. Among his writings on logic is organon, meaning tool or instrument. Here he defines the fundamental rules for making an argument. While other thinkers may well have formulated the argument before Aristotle. No one had made a systematic study of it. In organon, 
Aristotle puts forth a method for coming to a conclusion based on circumstantial evidence and prior conclusions rather than on the basis of direct observation. This deductive scheme, called a syllogism, is made up of a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. For example, every virtue is laudable, major premise, courage is a virtue. Minor premise, therefore courage is laudable, conclusion. It is worth noting, however, that the belief in deductive logic was later rejected by English philosopher Sir Francis Bacon 1561-1626 in 1620, in favor of an inductive system, or one that is based on observation. In Poetics, Aristotle expounded upon his literary views. He maintained that epic and tragedy portray human beings as nobler than they truly are. While comedy portrays them as less noble than they are. In order to explain how tragedy speaks to the emotions of the spectator, Aristotle introduced the idea of catharsis. He separated tragedy from epic with the distinction that tragedy maintains unity of plot. Later translated as unity of plot, time, and place, while the epic does not. Because of the keen understanding evident in poetics. The work has illuminated literary criticism since antiquity. In addition to logic and rhetoric, Aristotle wrote on natural science, physics. On the heavens, parts of animals, and on plants, and on ethics and politics, politics. His great philosophical work was metaphysics, so named because, in the body of his works, it comes after, the Greek word for which is meta, the work physics. Metaphysics as a philosophy is the study of substance, or the nature and structure of reality. It is considered one of five major branches of Western philosophy. In modern thought, metaphysics can include many disciplines, such as cosmology. The study of the origins and structure of the universe, and theology, the study of religion. Most of the great philosopher's writings are compilations of notes from lectures he delivered to his students at the Lyceum, also called the Peripatetic School, in Athens. Among his pupils there were Greek leaders, including Alexander the Great, 356-323 BC. How old is the calendar? The calendar that is in general use today is the Gregorian calendar. It dates to 1582, when Pope Gregory XIII, 1502-1585, asked for a revision of the Julian calendar. That calendar is named for its initiator, Julius Caesar, 100-44 BC, who in about 46 BC commissioned the astronomer Sosagenes of Alexandria to develop a universal solar calendar to be used throughout the Roman Empire. As Roman armies conquered more and more territory, the empire included many peoples and differing calendars, including the lunar-based Roman calendar. The Julian calendar consisted of a year of 365 days, with one day added every fourth year, leap year. 
when the year is divisible by 4, to compensate for the fact that the solar year is really 365.25 days. It had 12 months, each of 30 or 31 days except February, which had 28, and the new year began. On January 1st, the Gregorian calendar retained these features but revised the Julian to bring the Christian celebration of Easter in alignment with the vernal equinox, first day of spring. It also dropped leap years for any century year not divisible by 400 an effort to keep the solar calendar in line with the seasons. For example, 1900, though divisible by 4, was not a leap year since it was a centenary year not divisible by 400, the year 2000, divisible by 400, was a centenary leap year. How old is the compass? The first compass dates back to the first century B. C, when the Chinese observed that pieces of lodestone, an iron mineral, always pointed north when they were placed on a surface. There is evidence that Arab sailors were using compasses as early as AD 600, and as Arab influence spread north into Europe, so did the compass. By the 14th century, European ships carried maps that were charted with compass readings to reach different destinations. Portugal's Prince Henry, 1394 to 1460, also called Henry the Navigator, advanced the use of compasses in navigation by encouraging sailors and mapmakers to coordinate their information to make more accurate maps of the seas. Also in the 15th century, an important observation was made by none other than Genos navigator and explorer from Spain Christopher Columbus, 1451-1506, who noticed that as he sailed to the New World, his compass did not align directly with the North Star. The difference between magnetic north and true north is called declination. In the 16th and 17th centuries scientists began to better understand Earth's magnetic fields. American Elmer Sperry, 1860-1930, built the first gyro compass. A device that works day or night, anywhere on Earth even at the poles where lines of force are too close together for magnetic devices to function properly. When the gyro compass is pointed north, it holds that position. Before the compass, which simply indicates north by a means of a magnetic needle or needles that pivot. Sailors used the sun, the moon, and the stars to determine direction and navigate their ships. How long have humans been producing art? The first true art was originated by Homo sapiens sapiens. Called man the double wise, in Europe about 35,000 years ago, during the Stone Age. Man the Double Wise painted his own handprints, warrior images, and animals. Including bison, horses, and reindeer, on the walls and ceilings of uninhabited caves. In France and Spain between 35,000 BC and 8,000 BC. He used red, 
black, and yellow paints, which were made by mixing powdered earth and rock pigments with water. Among the most famous paintings are those in the caves at Lascaux, in Dordogne, France, Nio. Arige, France, Peck Merle, Lot, France, Gajola, Castellan, Spain, and Altamira, Cantabria, Spain. These early modern humans who, if dressed in contemporary clothing, would be nearly indistinguishable from anyone on a modern city street also decorated tools and created lifelike sculptures of animals and women. European man of this period, who had a fully developed human brain, is also referred to as Cro Magnon man for a shallow rock shelter near Laisies in the Dordogne region of southwestern France. Where, in 1868, skeletal remains of the tall, erect walking species were found. How long have humans been producing art? The first true art was originated by Homo sapiens sapiens. Called man the double wise, in Europe about 35,000 years ago, during the Stone Age. Man the Double Wise painted his own handprints, warrior images, and animals. Including bison, horses, and reindeer, on the walls and ceilings of uninhabited caves. In France and Spain between 35,000 BC and 8,000 BC. He used red, black, and yellow paints which were made by mixing powdered earth and rock pigments with water. Among the most famous paintings are those in the caves at Lasco, in Dordogne, France, Nio. Arige, France, Peck Merle, Lot, France, Gajola, Castellan, Spain, and Altamira, Cantabria, Spain. These early modern humans who, if dressed in contemporary clothing, would be nearly indistinguishable from anyone on a modern city street also decorated tools and created lifelike sculptures of animals and women. European man of this period, who had a fully developed human brain, is also referred to as Cro Magnon Man for a shallow rock shelter near Laisies in the Dordogne region of southwestern France. Where, in 1868, skeletal remains of the tall, erect walking species were found. When did people begin to write? If writing is viewed as a means of communicating between humans, using conventional visible marks, then writing spans the entire history of visual communication from early pictographic picture writing, beginnings to alphabetical writing. The oldest picture writing identified thus far was found in Mesopotamia. Present-day Iraq, the valley between the lower Tigris and Euphrates rivers. This writing, called cuneiform, dates back to the last centuries of the 4th millennium BC. C. 3700 BC. The finding consisted of about a dozen pictures inscribed on both sides of a limestone tablet. The characters are made up of wedge-shaped strokes, the system was probably created by the Sumerians. A non-Semitic people whose origins are unknown, 
they probably immigrated to Southwest Asia. Mesopotamia, from the east. Cuneiform pictographs closely resemble Egyptian hieroglyphics. Picture script developed by ancient Egyptian priests and perfected by the first Egyptian dynasty. 3110 to 2884 BC. Egyptian hieroglyphics consisted of some 600 symbols, phonograms. Cuneiform and hieroglyphic systems were the predecessors to the alphabet. When did people begin to write? If writing is viewed as a means of communicating between humans, using conventional visible marks, then writing spans the entire history of visual communication from early pictographic picture writing, beginnings to alphabetical writing. The oldest picture writing identified thus far was found in Mesopotamia. Present-day Iraq, the valley between the lower Tigris and Euphrates rivers. This writing, called cuneiform, dates back to the last centuries of the 4th millennium BC. C. 3700 BC. The finding consisted of about a dozen pictures inscribed on both sides of a limestone tablet. The characters are made up of wedge-shaped strokes, the system was probably created by the Sumerians. A non-Semitic people whose origins are unknown, they probably immigrated to Southwest Asia. Mesopotamia, from the east. Cuneiform pictographs closely resemble Egyptian hieroglyphics. Picture script developed by ancient Egyptian priests and perfected by the first Egyptian dynasty. 3110 to 2884 BC. Egyptian hieroglyphics consisted of some 600 symbols, phonograms. Cuneiform and hieroglyphic systems were the predecessors to the alphabet.